Well, I don't know what I did wrong to uh, get scheduled to speak while you eat. <laughs> um, I used to uh, I used to buy my groceries as a classical guitarist, and this uh, reminds me of when I would play in restaurants and bar mitzvahs and all that sort of thing. Um, but no, I, I, I appreciate being here and uh, and very much uh, been um, stimulated by the talks thus far. Um, but now I'm going to bring the faith element in here. Um, this is Faith and Freedom, uh, part of the sponsored coalition. And what I've enjoyed so much about the talks today is how they're so paradigm shifting. And, and I think that's um, what uh, education reform, when all is said and done, as I understand it, involves. It involves a real sort of totalizing paradigm shift so that social arrangements, practices, power relations begin to commonly shift. And, and I think that is um, especially true when we think of this thing called faith-based education. Um, I've entitled the talk Faith-Based Education, Religion, and the Secular State. I'm a prof, so I always come up with really scary <laughs> uh, titles, but they work well in German. Um, uh, by way of introduction, I, I'm assuming obviously we're all familiar with the term uh, faith-based education. Uh, but what we may not be aware of is how misleading this term can be in our modern educational context. While faith-based education is the accepted nomenclature du jour for what we would otherwise call parochial or religious education, it nonetheless entails a profoundly deceptive dichotomy that pervades modern social arrangements and power relations. Specifically, the term faith-based education erroneously suggests that there is such a thing as education that is not faith-based. That is, faith-based education perpetuates the idea that we have on the one side mere education, which involves the introduction and mastery of the elementary constituents of linguistic, mathematic, and scientific literacy, while on the other side we have faith-based education, which accomplishes the same thing, the same literacy, but it adds something to the mix, namely the initiation of the student into a set of moral values that are specific to a particular kind of religious persuasion. The operative assumption is that religious persuasion, what we call public education, are in fact distinct. They represent two fundamentally different social domains. One is public, and the other is private. One is objective, and the other is subjective. One teaches facts and data common to all, and one teaches faith commitments and dogma common to only some. Now, the, fun, the, the fundamental problem with this picture is that it's contradicted by over a century of cultural anthropological research, which has collectively, collectively found that religion is not merely a private or personal set of values or beliefs. For example, anthropologists have observed that belief in gods is not a necessary component to religion, as Confucians and Taoists and Buddhist societies demonstrate. They have uh, no particular God. Rather, anthropologists see religion as constituting the rules, understandings, and goals that govern any social order. Anthropologists have observed that all so social orders operate according to an idea of the sacred, that is, communally shared presuppositions that are considered absolutely true and unquestionable and thereby provide the foundation for a collective sense of the common good. So if I get pulled over by a police officer for speeding, and I say to him, you know, I really don't like that law, uh, he can say to me that, you know, that's all fine and dandy, but you still broke it. In this case, the law is absolute. It's unquestionable. I don't define it, it defines me. I may want to have the law changed, but if I do, then there's a procedure to do so 
that is itself absolute and unquestionable. <coughs> there is no social order that can operate without basic rules, understandings, and goals that define the common good for society in ways that are considered absolute and unquestionable. What this means is that there's simply no such thing as education that is faith-based and education that is not. All education is faith-based. All education initiates students into a particular social order with a particular vision of the common good that is considered absolute and unquestionable. So I think what we have to do is understand that when we consider this issue of faith-based education in the context of education reform, it's never a question of whether we're going to have faith-based education. The question is always, which faith-based education are we going to have? Now this observation obviously begs a question. Is it not the case that our current public schools make it a point neither to favor nor discriminate against any particular religion? As a public space, people of all faiths are, by definition, welcome to our schools. Your faith is special to you, and we respect that. But what our public education has done is it's carved out neutral space so as to allow people of all religions to gather together and learn facts and data common to everyone. Now this observation certainly suggests that not all education is faith-based. In fact, it makes it sound like the publicly neutral space of our schools established by a secular state is quite a noble and civic endeavor. No religion is favored and no one is discriminated against in our state-sponsored schools. This certainly sounds reasonable. But what if it turns out that it was, in fact, the secular state that redefined religion in this way? What if our understanding of faith and religion as that which belongs in one's private life rather than in the public square is itself the social invention of the secular state? What if religion has been redefined by the very institution that claims to protect it? In order to understand our educational context, we need to just briefly survey how education was understood for nearly 2,500 years in the Western world, from Plato to the mid-19th century. At the heart of what would be called classical education, was the project of awakening within the student a sense of what classical scholars call cosmic piety. This is a view that every person born into the world is born into a world of divine obligation. All people were obligated to orient their lives in a way that realizes the divine purpose for humanity. Thus, there was a profound sense that one was truly human only to the extent that one conformed their lives into a harmonious relationship with the cosmos. Thus, classical education sought to instill within students the transcendent values that are embedded in the created order, namely the true, the good, and the beautiful, what's known as the Socratic Trinity. It was believed that by embodying the true, the good, and the beautiful, students cultivated a virtuous balance in their souls. Classical education was therefore a project by which student was initiated into a social order that materialized or substantiated a cosmic piety that enabled the student to fulfill his or her divine purpose and thereby become truly human. And it is this vision of education that remained normative for 2,200 years, beginning with Plato, flourishing under the Romans, and then into Christendom, and all the way up to the mid-19th century. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the New England Primer, published in 1777, uh, but this was the public textbook, the public school textbook, that starts with teaching children the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, um, they learn their alphabet, in Adam's fall, we sinned all, they learned the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is a 1647 uh, Puritan, British Puritan Catechism. They learned their Proverbs, and they learned math, and they learned English, and on and on. 
But this, this was an expression of cosmic pieties. This is what life was. This is what reality and existence was. It was lived in a world filled with divine meaning and purpose. However, with the breakup of Christendom in the 17th century and the advent of the philosophical and scientific movement we today call the Enlightenment, a very humble term, <laughs> it became increasingly plausible to view knowledge as limited solely to that which could be verified by a method, namely the scientific method. It was argued that only those things that could be, that could be verified by the scientific method were those things that could be known in a way that was completely detached from the observer. Anything that was not subjected to or failed this method was reduced to the state of person relativity and excluded from the arena of what can be known. Thus, knowledge was now open to man. All they had to do in any area of life was to simply apply the method. But there was a toll that we had to pay for such promise. And one of the first victims of this new view of knowledge was cosmic fire. Because divine meaning and purpose are impervious to the scientific method, it cannot be known. And so it became increasingly plausible to view the world around us is comprised solely of cause and effect processes that have no meaning to it whatsoever, apart from that which I personally choose to give to it. And as a result of this new view of knowledge, you have a whole new definition of religion. Religion is no longer a civilizational expression of <coughs> cosmic piety and social obligation. Instead, Religion is simply something that you personally believe, but you cannot know. It is that which gives you private meaning, but religion has no public, that is, objective value at all. And if religion cannot be known, then it never leaves the realm of doubt. And thus, doubt is the proper orientation toward religious claim. So the rise of the scientific method is the sole way of knowing with this rise. You have, in fact, beginning in the 17th and 18th centuries, the church gradually pushed completely from the public square into the periphery of life and consigned solely to one's private life. And concomitant with this relativization of the church was a dramatic shift in human values. C.S. Lewis summarized profoundly the shift in his 1944 book on the state of British education entitled The Abolition of Man. Lewis argues that for classical man, the fundamental question was how do I conform my soul to the world around me and thus be drawn up into divine life? And the answer was through prayer, through cultivation of wisdom, and through virtue. However, for modern man, the question has been inverted. Modern man's not interested in how to conform the soul to reality. Rather, modern man asks, how do I conform the world to my own desires and my own ambitions? And the answer involves tapping into those institutions that operate by the mechanisms of power, namely science, technology, and the state. A new holy trinity. It is particularly the last institution, the state, that has effectively recalibrated every aspect of social, economic, and yes, educational life around a secular axis. And it has done so by effectively marginalizing any competing vision of the sacred that defines the common good. And it has effectively marginalized any competing vision of the sacred by reinventing our conception of faith and religion in accordance with secular enlightenment norms. Faith and religion are little more than instrumental means by which individuals find personal meaning and purpose for their lives. The secular state has in the process assumed a totalizing monopoly over the sacred the absolute, the unquestionable. 
and is therefore, from the vantage point of the anthropologist, the source of the religion of the secular age. The irony of our secular social world is that the one true religion that we can authentically practice in the context of the social order is the one that denies its own religiosity. The extent to which the secular state denies it as a religion, by virtue of its reinvention of religion, is the extent to which it can be faithfully practiced as a religion. So now we're in a position to return to our original question. Is it not the case that our current public schools make it a point neither to favor nor discriminate against any particular religion? As a public space, are our people all faced by definition welcome to our school? Well, if we redefine religion to include everything from Christianity to Wicca, then yeah. But that is only true to the extent that modern education is successful in redefining religion in such a way that excludes itself from that definition. <clears throat> and modern public education excludes itself from the definition of religion by perpetuating a dichotomy between education and faith-based education, between fact and faith, knowledge and belief, public and private. And this dichotomy this consignment of science and religion into two different social domains, the public and the private, is not itself based on a scientific experiment, and it is not itself intrinsic to any logical formula. The dichotomy between science and religion, public knowledge and private belief, is nothing less than a creed. It is a confession of faith. what anthropologists call an ultimate sacred posture. <laughs> <laughs> and it is this creed, this religion of the secular social order, that is forced upon students across the nation every day in state-monopolized schools. And what is the effect of this initiation? But by insisting upon this dichotomy between science and religion, modern education must by definition turn students away from the classical vision of cosmic piety. And by turning students away from the classical vision of cosmic piety, it cuts them off from encountering the cosmic virtues of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Today, in our schools, and our wider society, the true, the good, and the beautiful are whatever you want them. Truth is relative. There is no absolute morals. And beauty is whatever terms you want. I know, I teach aesthetics. You <laughs> should hear the answers I get when I ask students what is beautiful. You are born into a world where you have no divine obligations whatsoever apart from that which you choose personally to impose upon yourself. But if students are cut off from encountering the transcendent, then you cut them off from the very source of virtue. We've cut them off from the cosmic values by which they might foster a balanced soul and thus become truly human. We are discovering that we cannot teach our students that truth is relative and expect our politicians to be honest. We can't claim that morality is replaced by situational ethics and expect Wall Street executives to ground their business decisions in anything other than profit, greed, and expediency. And we cannot embody an aesthetic relativity and then be shocked when we see blasphemy paid for by public monies. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. And all the time, such is the tragic comedy of our situation. We continue to clamor for those very qualities we are rendering impossible. You can hardly open a periodical 
without coming across the statement that what our civilization needs is more drive or dynamism or self-sacrifice or creativity. In a sort of ghastly simplicity, we remove the organ and demand the function. We make men without chests and expect of them virtue and enterprise. We lack their honor and are shocked to find traitors in our midst. We castrate and bid the Gelbings be fruitful. So I simply do not believe that there will be any real solution to our current educational crisis if there is anything less than a unified rejection of this religion science faith fact dichotomy that is at the heart of the secular state's monopoly over public education. All education is faith-based. And that faith that is being taught today is one in which the basic frames of reference necessary for the cultivation of civic virtue are simply defined out of existence. And the only way to know, the only way to determine that our education is doing it right from this vantage point is a flourishing and beautiful culture. There is no quantifiable table here. So what I'm really arguing for here is nothing less than a paradigm shift, one that recognizes that the public of public schools has been radically redefined. This is not simply a matter of low test scores or high tax dollars. They bug me, no question. But it's more, it's about whether parents have the freedom to choose which faith their students will be educated in. Therefore, I'm not arguing against public schools and for parochial schools. I'm arguing against the secular monopolization by the state over the publicly defined sacred from which our dichotomy between public and parochial schools is an extension. It is here in challenging the secular monopolization that the school choice movement is most relevant and effective, and I think why it is so viscerally resistant. The school choice movement challenges the dichotomy between public and parochial, the scientific and religious, knowledge and belief. And as such, it challenges the secular redefinition of religion that is the necessary precondition for the state's monopolization over the sacred. You can couple this too with the last three decades where we see nothing less than a renaissance of classical education in our nation that's restoring the sense of the true, the good, and the beautiful back in the lives of these students. Back in 94, there were only 10 classical schools. Today, there are over 230. In 2002, student enrollment in classical schools doubled from 17,000 nationwide to 35,000. We're already seeing the, the results. They have the highest SAT, in 2011, have the highest SAT scores in each of the three categories of reading, math, and writing for all independent parochial public schools. I would be remiss, I haven't seen anyone here yet with it, but I'd be remiss not to mention the explosion of homeschooling of the last decade alone and all the technology that we I heard about today, I think it's only going to feed into that. Uh, in 2000, there was an estimated 2,100,000 children homeschooled nationwide. It grew to 2.5 million in 2009, 7 to 15 percent increase. And according to the National Center of Educational Statistics, the percentage of all school age children homeschooled in the United States increased from 1.7 percent in 1999 to 3 percent in 2009 a 74% increase over a 10-year period. So all of these developments, the school reform, school of choice, classical schools, and homeschooling, we have every reason, I believe, to be optimistic that the days of the secular state's monopoly over public education are numbered, and that the frames of reference necessary for a virtuous citizenry will be restored to our educational enterprises a restoration that will transform the lives of our students and communities for generations to come.